It's number 352. And let's stand to sing. Think about that, that Christ would come into the world to save sinners such as we are. It's unfathomable. We find that Christ came to save not good people, but he came to save sinners. And we've been looking at that as we've viewed the opening verses here in Acts chapter 9 with Saul, who then becomes the apostle Paul. Amazing portion of text as we look at these opening seven or eight verses in Acts chapter 9. You recall last week, Gary Johnson was with us presenting his mission work in Africa, but the week before that, we looked at the question that Saul asks of our Lord Jesus Christ, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Gracious Heavenly Father, we pray for your blessings upon your word as it goes forth tonight, that it would not return void, but that it would accomplish that which you please and prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. You are the sovereign Lord. You have sent forth your word. 
you have given us your word in our own language. And you expect us not merely to hear it, but you expect us to obey it. And someday, every one of us in this room will have to give an account as to whether or not we have been merely hearers of the word, but whether or not we have been doers of the word, deceiving our own selves. Father, bless your word as it goes forth tonight, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. As we noted last week, as we looked at this portion of text, the Apostle Paul was following the letter of the law. He was a Pharisee. He made sure that he got legal authority and religious authority, and not just merely on his own impulse, starting a crusade against the Christians. He wanted to make sure that the Sanhedrin was behind him in rooting out this heresy. He was zealous for the purity of traditional Judaism. He didn't care about believers who went to the Samaritans. He didn't care about believers who went off in some faraway Gentile place. He got letters to go to the synagogues to root out all the Christians who might be there. He had no mercy on the women we saw last week. He knew that they were the ones who rocked the cradle and ruled the world and wanted to nip this in the bud. He didn't try to accomplish his mission on his own. He was a leader. He took others with him. He wanted to make sure that nobody got out the back door when he came in the front. He had apparently heard that the direction the Christians were spreading in the synagogues was north along the trade routes and up to Damascus. Damascus, by the shortest route, was 140 miles from Jerusalem. That's a very long way to walk. But Paul would not have taken the shortest way because that passed through Samaria, and he was a very orthodox Jew. He would not have wanted to sully himself with the dirt of Samaria. So he would have gone across the Jordan River from Jerusalem down to Jericho, across the Jordan, and up the far side of the Jordan River so that he could get to the city of Damascus. But in that course, he would have added 20 more miles to his journey. In that course, he would have also had to cross the Mount Hermon Range, which stands over 9,000 feet high. And Paul was either walking or riding on a horse, and it's a long way in that terrain. He was determined to obliterate the Christians. He was excited about killing Christians. He had been present when Stephen, the first martyr, was stoned to death in Acts chapter 8. And as we noted last week, just putting a long way between yourself and those who are persecuting Christians, and this is happening all over the world today, in your bulletins this morning, you saw the insert that dealt with persecuted Christians, believers, who are being killed in other parts of the world today. Just putting yourself in a position that's a long way away from the persecutor doesn't guarantee your safety. But we saw last week what does. The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Proverbs 29, 25. Proverbs 21, 31. The horse is prepared against the day of battle, but safety is of the Lord. 2 Timothy 1, 7. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. 
Proverbs 28, 1, The wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are bold as a lion. Fear is a snare. Righteousness gives protection and safety. It is the Lord in whom we trust who delivers us. We see that in the text here. We see that as we move through the text at the rest of the end of the chapter, how Saul's viewpoint of Christ suddenly changes. He had caught Christians before, but suddenly as he goes for this particular group of Christians, Jesus stands between him and them. The Lord can stand in the way of those who are disobedient and walking out of the way. We see that as the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament stands between Balaam and his nefarious deeds. Dear people, do you really trust in the Lord? That is where our only safety is. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. And so we find... Saul was on his way to catch Christians, but Jesus stood in the way as their protection because Jesus had other plans to fulfill and he was going to use the persecutor, the one who had killed Christians, the one who had voted for their deaths, the one who had stood by in glee holding the coats of others who were stoning Stephen to death. God was going to use that man. What is your past? What are the things that you've done? Did you know that when you come under the power and the control of Jesus Christ, God can use you as he did Saul, a man who was a persecutor and injurious, but as Paul says, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in an unbelief. And God used that man to write most of the New Testament. Here is the crisis meeting between Jesus and Saul, who would be later given the name Paul. We talked about the victories that we have in Christ, and sometimes those are deliverance experiences. We see that in the first half of Hebrews 11. But we noted also last week that there are heroes of faith who had to suffer. Others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings. Yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment, they were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they were tempted, they were slain with the sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. That's the second half of the heroes of faith. But it tells us they all obtained a good report through faith and they didn't receive the promise. God having provided some better thing, are you ready? For us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Dear friends, I suspect that someday persecution, I mean genuine persecution, not Mickey Mouse kind of sneers from some coworker, Genuine persecution, whereby some of us may have to give our lives, is going to come to America. That they without us should not be made perfect, teleos, complete. There's a list of heroes of faith that God is collecting together in heaven. And it includes those of us who walk by faith. Sometimes we'll have great deliverance and great victory. Sometimes we may suffer even to the point of death. We noted the part of the text that was the key for last week. I want us to remember it again. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? What wilt thou have me to do? Paul never asked that question while he was busy trying to accomplish his own plans. He never asked that question while he was in perfect health and could see with both his eyes. He never asked that question while he was in control of the situation. He never asked that question before he left his home in Jerusalem to start the journey. He never asked that question before he went to the chief priests at the temple or while he was with the chief priests in the temple. He never asked that question as he stood holding the coats at the death of Stephen. He never asked that question 
of his own inner motives. He never prayed about that question. He never studied the scripture or asked for insights into the claims concerning what the Old Testament taught about the coming Messiah and whether Jesus fit the claims. Paul never asked that question until God stopped him dead in his tracks. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Have you ever been there? Where you've been going on your merry way, doing your own thing, deciding your own plans and making those plans without any consideration of what God would have you to do. And then suddenly God stopped you in your tracks. When he stops you in your tracks, it's the time to listen to what he would have you to do. Don't expect somebody else to solve all your problems for you. Don't expect somebody else to come along and say, well, look, Saul, you need some medical attention, I'll pay your medical bill. Don't expect someone to come along and give you your answers right away. Saul had to wait for them. Expect instead to have a time of soul searching before the living God who suddenly remains silent. We want God to give us answers right away. We want God to give us money right away. We want God to give us food right away. We want God to give us a car right away. We want God to give us this and this and this and this and this right away. Dear friends, as you look at the text tonight, that's not how God works. When God brings us up short, it's so that we can if you will, sit and stew in our own juice for a while and consider why we don't deserve anything. Why should God give us anything? We have been rebels. We've been disobedient. We had light and we rejected it. We knew what the Word of God said on some issue and we decided, I'm not going to do it God's way. God does not owe us any favors. I know that's hard for some of us to hear, but God doesn't have any obligation to us. It's rather interesting. When did God stop him? It was just as he was about to complete his journey. God could have hit him with the blinding light in Jerusalem and saved him all the trouble of walking to Damascus. But God chose not to do so. Instead, God was going to make him retrace that painful journey back to Jerusalem so he would have plenty of time to think about what he had done. We don't like to retrace our steps that we suddenly discover were worthless after all. We don't like to go back and think about those things in the past. But Saul was going to have to walk 140, 160 miles back through rugged terrain and horrible heat, remembering every step that he had taken to get to Damascus. But you know, there's something else interesting there as we think about it. Because God had certain ones of his own people at Damascus. God was using even the rebellion of Saul to get him in contact with a certain man by the name of Ananias. You see, God was going to work in Ananias' life. Ananias had certain fears in his heart. Ananias was going to be called up short to do something that he was afraid to do. God got Saul all the way to just outside the gates of Damascus before he stopped him and changed his spiritual course but let him finish his physical course. When he asked, Lord, what do you want me to do? God told him, get up and go to Damascus. 
It's exactly where he was going, but with the wrong motive, with the wrong zeal, with the wrong desires, with hatred in his heart. And then Jesus Christ stepped into his life and changed him and said, now you're going to go to Damascus just like you had planned to do, but there's going to be something different in your plans that you didn't plan, but that I planned. What is it God has called you to do after your, if you will, Damascus Road experience? Have you obeyed? Or did you decide, I don't think I want to go to Jerusalem. I'm pretty shaken right now. It's been a scary experience. I think I'll just go back home to your Jerusalem. Folks, God brings scary experiences into our lives. And he does it so we'll wake up and learn to trust him instead of ourselves. God told him, go on, go to Damascus. The second thing we noticed last week was that the light that knocked him off his horse was a very unique light. It happened suddenly, not gradually. Suddenly there shined round about him. It was a light from heaven. Suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. It wasn't the normal light. It happened at noon, the brightest part of the day, not in the middle of the night. It was above the brightness of the sun. That was the Shekinah glory. That was God speaking to him out of the light of heaven. It was a light that contained a person. It was a light that Saul recognized being a good Jew. He would have known what the Shekinah glory was from the Old Testament. It was a light that contained a singular personal message for him. Those people around him heard this sound, but, but they didn't understand the words. He says that to us in Acts 26, 14 and Acts 9, 7. Sometimes you have heard my voice speaking in this auditorium, and because the sound system wasn't adjusted quite right, you could hear my voice, but you could not determine what the words were that I said. The men heard the voice, but they could not distinguish the words the text tells us. What wilt thou have me to do? And the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ answered him from heaven. Do you remember the questions we asked last week? Lord, the recognition of Christ as God, what wilt you have me to do? He didn't ask, what wilt thou have me to believe? He didn't ask, what wilt thou have me to think about? He didn't ask, what wilt thou have me to say to someone else? He didn't ask, what wilt thou have me argue with you? He didn't ask, what evidence do you give to prove you are who you claim to be? None of that. You see, those are all questions that try to avoid personal responsibility. Those are all questions that help us get away from this idea that all we want is knowledge and all we want is a packaged theology. We want to have this tidy little box up on a shelf called, What I Know About God. Every now and then we take that little box down, we dust it off, and we open it up so we can impress somebody with, look how spiritual I am. Dear friends, there are three things that you must know about theology. Theology is a wonderful study. It used to be called the queen of the sciences because it is not studying something that is obscure, irrational, or untrue. It is studying the truth about the most important things in the universe, a science far greater than biology or chemistry or physics, a science far greater than the study of DNA or any of these other things that point back to our Creator. Theology is the study of God Himself. It is the greatest of the sciences. But there are three things about theology that each one of us must learn. Otherwise, it becomes useless to us to study it. 
Number one, true theology will always change your life. I frequently run into people who say, oh yes, I'm a Christian. They can even mouth the various words that are necessary to explain what the gospel is. My question to them is, and so you believe that Christ died for your sins, was buried and rose again. Heart of the gospel. They say yes. My next question to them is, so how has it changed your life? It's a very important question. So how has it changed your life? True theology, truly believed, is not a box on the shelf that says, look what I know about God. True theology is radical, life-changing truth. When you know Jesus Christ, it changes your life. What was the first word out of Paul's mouth? Lord. Instantaneously, he submitted to the Lordship of Christ. True theology, number one, will always change your life. In changing your life, it does certain things. It eradicates certain things. It adds certain things that were missing. In the past, you used to drink and smoke and chew and go with girls that do. Oh yes, I know, that's, that's trivial and it sounds trivial, but the things that used to possess you, the things that used to control you, the things that you used to do habitually, the things that you used to love, the things that used to motivate your flesh, God begins to eradicate those things from your life. And you don't go back to them. God begins to add certain things to your life. He adds to your life a thirst for the word of God. He adds to your life times of intense prayer. He adds to your life an earnest desire to tell others about Jesus and to let them examine your life to see if they find there anything that is contrary to scripture. Look how he changed me, you say. And they examine and they discover, yes, he changed you. That's number one. True theology, when truly believed, will change your life. It will add certain things, it will eradicate certain things. Number two, we see that with Paul here on the Damascus Road. True theology will always require obedience. Let me say it again. True theology will always require obedience. True theology is never merely a matter of head knowledge. Number three. We see all of these in the life of Paul from this point on. This gives to us a pattern of what it is like to come in living contact with the living God. Number three. True theology will always, not just sometimes, True theology, when rightly believed, will always produce a growing, not a static, relationship with God. Because you see, it's a love relationship. And those of you who are married or who have been married know that love is necessary and it is a growing relationship within the context of the marriage. Elizabeth Barrett Browning, Grow Old With Me. The sonnets of love that she wrote. Love is not merely the ecstatic relationship of the young couple on their wedding night. 
Love is something that grows and becomes deeper and richer as the things of the flesh begin to wane. Our relationship with God is a relationship of love. God is the initiator. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It's a relationship that is a reciprocal relationship. We love him because he first loved us. We sang about the love of God a little earlier tonight. How deep and expansive it is. Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus. Dear friends, true theology, if you really believe it, will produce a growing love for the one who first loved you. It will produce a growing, not a static relationship with God where you hold him at arm's length. You say, God, I appreciate the fact that you've saved me, you've given me a fire escape from hell, but I'm going to go ahead and live my own life. If you've trusted Christ, that won't happen. Your life will be changed. Blind and dead before resurrection, Saul rose from the earth with his eyes opened, but he saw no man. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus, and he was three days without sight, neither did eat nor drink. We have a picture given to us here. Blind and dead before resurrection. We look at the last sentence in our previous text, which was in verse 6. God, the Lord Jesus Christ, says to him, Arise, go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. The first thing he was supposed to do was get up off the ground. So often we get knocked to the ground by something in life and we sit on the ground. And we feel sorry for ourselves, And we think somebody else ought to come along and take care of us. And we think somebody else ought to pay our bills. And somebody else ought to do this for us. And we get the, the entitlement mentality, the welfare mentality that, hey, it's really not my problem. Everybody else is responsible for me. What was the first thing that God told him to do? Get up. Get up. Quit sitting and feeling miserable and sorry for yourself. Arise. I've got work for you to do. As long as we start, uh, continue feeling sorry for ourselves, we will never please God. As long as we expect somebody else to do what God has assigned us to do, we will never please God. As long as we sit around thinking that somebody else ought to be paying our bills and giving us a silver spoon in our mouth, God is not going to be pleased with us. Saul was an energetic man. Saul was moving forward. God knocked him to the ground. After he finds out who it is that knocked him to the ground, the Lord Jesus, he asks, what do you want me to do? He doesn't say, Lord, that hurt. Hey, I can't see. This is no fun. I was doing what I thought was right. I was, I was trying to persecute those Christians. He didn't say any of that. And Jesus didn't wimpily hold his hand and say, There, there now, don't feel too bad. Jesus gave him a command, Get up. Get up. Get moving. Quit feeling sorry for yourself. Arise and go into Damascus. And there it shall be told thee what thou must do. Get up and do what you can do, which is, you can walk. I didn't cripple you. I made you blind, yeah, but I didn't cripple you. Now get up and move forward. And when you get there, I'm not going to answer your whole question right now. When you get there, then it will be told you what you must do. And it will not be a matter of, would you like to do this? I have five options for you. Which one of them do you think is best? It shall be told thee what thou must do. You ask me, Lord, what shall I do? Okay. It will be told you what you must do. 
But the first thing that you have to do is get up. When you obey that first little tiny command, then you've got a second command. Go into Damascus. Now, getting up is not as hard as walking the rest of the way of the journey, especially if you're blind. But if you can obey those first two steps, then you'll get the answer to your big question. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Notice something else. Saul asked two questions, but Jesus only gave him one direct answer. The first question that he asks in the text is, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord Jesus gave him a direct answer to that question so that there would be no question as to the authority under which Paul had suddenly come. The direct answer was, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. That was his first question. He got a direct answer because that would determine the answer to the second question. The second was, what wilt thou have me to do? And he got an indirect answer. Go to town and somebody will tell you what you have to do. Now, I think that if you were Saul, that would not be a very comforting answer. Saul was at this moment in extreme shock. It says he was trembling and he was astonished. His world had suddenly crumbled around him. He suddenly found himself in free fall. He suddenly found himself in the depths of oceans where the waves were a hundred feet high and the sharks were circling him. That was not a very comforting answer. Get up and go to town. Lord, my world has just crumbled. Has your world just crumbled at any time? There may be some watching this over the internet whose world has just crumbled. Or they look around themselves and they see that their world is crumbling and they're trying to hold on as best they can. Saul is in extreme panic when he cries out, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? He's trembling. He's astonished. He can't control his own muscles. Notice something else about the text. God was in no hurry to answer his question, and God is in no hurry to answer our questions, which usually take the form of a challenge. We shake our fist, God, why did you let this happen? God, why aren't you doing what I thought you were going to do? God is in no hurry to answer our questions. He is the one who controls our lives. He is the one who controls our destiny. He is the one who controls the timing of the circumstances. But we need to understand in that context, God is under no obligation to even answer our questions at all. We see all around us in the world people who are shaking their fist at God, people who are telling God to do something and that's the only way they'll believe in him. That's like the, the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees sitting around the foot of the cross and saying, well, let's see whether or not God answers his questions. Let's see whether or not Elias comes to take him down off the cross. Dear people, Never shake your fist in the face of God. Saul doesn't ask that kind of question. But we frequently find people, perhaps we've done it in our own lives, people around us who do ask the questions as a challenge. But remember, God is under no obligation to even answer our questions at all. He can leave us in the dark forever if he wishes to do so. The second thing we learn about the questioning is that some of our questions are not timely. God did not give Saul a full answer at that time. God was going to let him wait for a period before he heard more. In fact, God was going to tell certain things to Ananias about what he would do with Saul that he didn't tell Saul immediately. Saul had to find it out over a period of time. 
Some of our questions are not timely. Third, we are not ready in some cases to have our questions answered. Some of you remember the book The Hiding Place, Corrie ten Boom. And in that, she recounts a time when she was a little girl and when she asked a certain question of her father that little girls do not need to know the answers to. And her father wisely said to her, Corey, you see that suitcase over there? She said, yes. He said, would you go over and pick that suitcase up and bring it here? And she went over and tried to pick it up and she said, I can't pick it up, it's too heavy. And her father wisely replied, Corey, the answer to your question is too heavy. When you get older, you'll be able to pick up that suitcase and you'll also be able to understand the answer to the question. Sometimes we are not ready to have our questions answered. If God had hit Paul with the answer, the complete answer to that question at that very moment, Paul would not have been ready for it. Sometimes God uses our questions to make us ponder on his nature and character. As we ask the questions in helplessness, and he remains silent, we begin to think about who God really is, the sovereign of the universe. We begin to think about our own problem as a matter and result of our sin. Sometimes God uses our questions in and of themselves to open doors in our understanding as we ponder his word. Saul was going to sit for three days in the dark, neither eating nor drinking. But Saul was a man who had a great deal of scripture memorized. He was an Orthodox Jew. He had memorized massive portions of the Old Testament. Living in Israel, I, I met Jews just like that. I met people who I spoke to, young Israelis, who I would begin to quote a passage dealing with the Messiah, and they would finish the passage for me in Hebrew. They had memorized it in their studies growing up. One of the most zealous Jews who ever lived was Saul of Tarsus, who became the Apostle Paul. He studied under the most famous of all the rabbis in Jewish history, Rambans they call them. He studied at the feet of Gamaliel. He was a bright student. He had much scripture memorized, but he did not know who the Messiah was. Sometimes God lets us sit in silence so that we will meditate upon his word. You have sight. You may not have it all memorized, but when you come to those times where the heavens seem as brass, where God is silent and does not answer your questions, he has given you an answer already. It's time for you to start opening it and reading it and studying it and meditating upon it. It gives us the times of no answer so that we will begin to ponder his word. Sometimes God delays his answers to make us more ready and eager to hear the answer and not to take him and his directions for granted. If every time we ask God a question, every time there was something that was confusing in our lives, God just, boom, hit us with a bolt of blue and suddenly we knew the answer and we kept right on moving, we're cheerful and happy about it. You know, I've discovered in dealing with my own children that whenever I give them exactly what they want, when they want it, at their whim, at their demand, they don't appreciate it. Have any of you ever had that experience? with your own children? Have any of you ever had that experience as a child demanding of a parent and being sort of frustrated when they didn't give you immediately what you wanted right then? Sort of like your personal genie who has the money and you can go and buy the, buy the toy for them 
No, God is not like that. He's not our personal genie. He doesn't function on the basis of our whims, on the basis of our demands. Sometimes God delays his answers to make us more ready and eager to hear his answer and not to take him and his directions for granted. Sometimes God delays his answer because he is working in the heart and the life of someone else whom he will use to answer our question. You know, God is working not merely in your life. God is working in the lives of other people. God has a specific timing for interactions between people. We saw that with Philip in the Ethiopian eunuch. Philip being taken from a great revival in the north, up in Samaria. The Ethiopian eunuch traveling from Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit telling Philip, go to Gaza. And just as he reaches a certain point on the road, the Ethiopian eunuch is there, and the Ethiopian eunuch is reading a messianic prophecy out of Isaiah 53. And the Spirit says, go join yourself to the chariot. And Philip hears him reading and says, do you understand what you read? How can I understand except some man show me? And Philip leads him to Christ. He continues south. God picks him up and takes him 20 miles, takes Philip 20 miles to the north. And he has evangelistic crusades for the next 19 years until he reaches Caesarea. Dear people, we have a God who makes the intersections of our lives. Here we find Saul. He is about to experience an intersection of his life with someone else whom God is preparing specifically for that event. I think that all of those things that we've looked at, no obligation from God, untimely questions, not ready to have our questions answered and so on, the eight different things that we just looked at. I think that all of those things are at play in this situation here in Acts. Acts 9 is a real pattern for us when we want to know the answers to questions that we're asking in shock when we suddenly realize that God is not our lap dog. That passage also teaches us several other things that we tend to forget. We tend to forget that God is sovereign. Oh, if the sovereignty of God shows up anywhere, it shows up here. Jesus steps in front of Saul on the road, smacks him down with light, and suddenly shatters his worldview. We tend to forget that God is sovereign. We tend to forget that God is not subject to our plans to serve him. All of us have these plans whereby we want to serve God, or at least some of us do. But God is not subject to our plans. Third, we tend to forget that his will includes paying attention to the details that he has revealed in his word. Not merely looking at the general ideas and thinking, well, I sort of have a general idea of what God wants me to do, so I'll just sort of float through life. God wants us to pay attention to the details. We've been talking about that on Sunday mornings as we've looked at the names of God and the character of God and how it reveals the will of God. We tend to forget that God can stop the mouths of all the world when he wishes to do so. The text says, And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice but seeing no man. Paul picks that up in Romans chapter 3 where he reminds us that God will stop the mouths of the entire world by Jesus Christ. All the foolish arguments, all the foolish babbling that goes on around us, all the foolish complaints, God is going to stop every mouth. Every mouth. There will be an utter silence. The book of Revelation talks about it. It says, and there was silence in heaven. There comes a time, folks, 
when we need to stop talking and start listening to God. The men that traveled with him stood speechless. We also learn from this passage that God delights in using object lessons that will teach us the truth. Jesus used human birth to teach Nicodemus about the new birth in John 3. Jesus used water from a well to teach the Samaritan woman about the living water that he gives. Jesus used the Jewish feasts all the way through the Gospel of John to teach the true nature of who he, Jesus Christ, really is as the one who fulfills the typological significance of each one of those feasts. In this passage, God uses the object lesson of blindness to teach Paul about his true spiritual blindness. Paul didn't have hazy sight. Paul didn't have dim sight. Paul didn't have distorted sight. Paul didn't have sight in one eye and blindness in the other. Paul was blind. And when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus, and he was three days without sight. That's blind. You know, Paul would later, as an apostle, after this conversion experience, would have apostolic authority to perform miracles. And one of those miracles that he performed was a miracle of blindness. Acts 13.11, And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee. He's talking to Elymas the sorcerer. And thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately... Not gradually, not like some of us who every morning we get up and we can't see quite as well as we did yesterday. We're getting old and we're having macular degeneration or having to have you know, surgery to remove cataracts and what a blessing that is. I know some of you have experienced that and now can see so much better. Paul was blind and he does a miracle of blindness. Thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Paul had experienced that, but Paul's life was changed. And Elymas's life was not. You know, God can do the same thing in different people's lives. And one responds in a way which brings glory to God, and one refuses to respond. It doesn't matter what you've been through. Someone before you has gone through it. Someone has responded correctly. It doesn't matter what you're going through right now. The issue is, how will you respond to what God is doing in your life? The first thing is to arise. The second thing is to follow the simple directions. Go to Damascus. And then you might have to wait for a while, as did Saul. In your miserable condition, three days he sat there neither eating nor drinking in total darkness. Dear people, we don't like to go through those experiences. But Paul would use this blindness as an illustration of his own Jewish legalism in condemning the legalists at Rome. Listen to what he writes in Romans 2.19. And art confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness. He's talking to those who think they know the law and that they are going to be top dog and don't realize that they're blind. Peter, under inspiration, uses blindness as an illustration of present spiritual darkness when our lives are void of a remembrance of the graces of God. Listen to what Peter says in 2 Peter 1.4. It's a biblical illustration because it is a consistent illustration, not merely happening to Saul. But this explains spiritual blindness. 
Listen to what Peter writes, beginning in verse 4, 2 Peter 1. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. Do you remember what we said a few minutes ago? Genuine faith, in true theology, is radically life-changing. The things you used to do, you don't do now. The things that you didn't used to do, which glorify God, now you begin to do. So what does he say to add to your faith? Okay, you've trusted Christ. What are you supposed to add to your faith? What's the first thing that you add to your faith? Add to your faith virtue. That's a changed life, people. Virtue, that's a word which means excellence in righteousness. Add to your faith, virtue. When somebody tells me they've trusted in Christ, when somebody tells me they're saved, when somebody tells me, you know, the gospel, they know what all the words are and they know what will manipulate an evangelical, Bible-believing, fundamentalist pastor so that they can get something out of him. When people tell me that, I ask them the question, so how has your faith changed your life? important question. Remember it when people try to manipulate you. What proof can you give? What proof can you give that you are saved? If you have no proof, if you have no change in life, it tells me something that's very important. You're not saved. You've never repented of your sins. Because repentance means to turn from one direction and to make 180 degrees and go the other direction. Repentance is not feeling sorry for your sins. Repentance is a change of life. The scripture requires it. Be ye holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. We spoke on that last Sunday morning. We spoke on that this Sunday morning. How true faith changes lives and makes them into lives of holiness. It is the Holy Spirit who changes us. Add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, because from then you're going to grow. We talked about that a moment ago. There's going to be a desire for the Word of God. So you add to your faith virtue, you add to virtue knowledge. But it doesn't stop there. To knowledge, temperance, that's self-control. To temperance, patience. To patience, godliness. To godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, charity. That's agape, God's kind of love. Now listen, verse 8. Here's our key verse. Verses 8 and 9. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Barren and unfruitful. We are to bear the fruit of the Spirit. If you don't have those things in your life, you will not bear the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Galatians chapter 5. You will not be barren. There will be some product in your life that shows. You can look at a pear tree, and if it doesn't have any pears on it, you don't know whether it's any good or not. You can look at an apple tree. If it doesn't have any apples on it, if it never bears any fruit, if season by season goes by and there's never an apple on that tree... It's worthless, ought to be cut down. Are you bearing fruit? Is there something that's visible, that is beneficial to others, that shows in your life? Neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, verse 9. But he that lacketh these things is, you can say it, blind. He that lacketh these things is blind. Saul was blind. He was religious, but he was blind. He was energetic, but he was blind. He was on the road to do what he thought was God's will, but he was blind. If you lack these things, you are, present tense, blind. Then he tells us two other things, things about the future, things about the past. Present tense, he's blind. But then he says, and cannot see afar off. You don't know what's coming down the road. You don't see what's in the future. You don't understand the purposes and plans and promises of God. He cannot see afar off. And then the past tense, and hath forgotten 
that he was purged from his old sins. That was the past tense. Your people, here's a man who never got past step one, which was faith. That he was purged from his old sins. Instead, he continues on in the same old sins. He's forgotten the past. He can't see the future. He's currently blind. Spiritual condition. John, quoting Jesus, uses blindness to speak of the things of this world that cause us to fall in our love for Christ. Revelation chapter 3, verse 17. John is merely the amanuensis. He's merely the scribe of the book of Revelation. It is Jesus who appears in chapter 1 and who speaks to John and tells him, write the things I'm about to tell you. These are the words of the resurrected Christ in Revelation chapter 3, verse 17. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. What does it put them in that condition? They had everything they wanted. This was a rich church. This was a church that said, I'm rich. I have increased goods. I have need of nothing. The things of this world had turned their hearts and thus their spiritual sight away from Christ. You think you've got everything, but you do not know that you are wretched. You don't understand that you're miserable. You have no concept that you are poor. In fact, you're blind, and because of that you don't know you're naked. That's a pathetic situation for somebody who thinks they have it all. Our Lord Jesus Christ, after he healed the man born blind in John chapter 9, says, we find here people questioning that man, and then again called they the man that was blind and said unto him, give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. <laughs> Amazing. The Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes calling Jesus a sinner. Talk about utter blindness, utter hypocrisy, utter stupidity. He, that is the blind man, the one who was formerly blind, answered and said, Whether he be a sinner or no, I know not, but one thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I see. In verse 39 of the same chapter, And Jesus said, For judgment I am come into this world, that they which see not might see, and that they which see might be made blind. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? And Jesus said unto them, If ye were blind, ye should have no sin. But now ye say, We see. Therefore, your sin remaineth. Again, we're desperately out of time. So let me summarize the last point this way. It says that he was blind for three days, neither eating nor drinking. Dead men don't eat or drink. And it's interesting that Jesus chose three days to let this happen. He didn't choose one day, two days, a week. He didn't choose a month. He chose three days. Because our Lord Jesus Christ died and rose again three days later. Jesus is reminding him of this central doctrine of the resurrection which he had heard, but he had rejected. Do you not think that he knew about the resurrection? He certainly did. He heard Stephen's sermon in Acts 7 even if he had never heard anything else before that, and that is quite doubtful, but even if he had never heard anything else about the apostles' message, he would have known that the resurrection of Christ was central to that message. In fact, without the resurrection, Jesus is just like everybody else, dead. He had heard that after three days Jesus rose from the dead. He had heard that message, and he hated that message, and he stood there as a young man holding the coats of those who were stoning Stephen to death. And so our Lord Jesus, in his wisdom, 
And in the gentle way with which he deals with us, though we think it's a terrible, traumatic experience when it happens, Jesus let him sit for three days in total darkness, like the darkness of a tomb. Three days to meditate upon the messages he had heard and to contemplate the Old Testament scriptures which he had memorized. Three days, death and resurrection. And Paul remembers that in 1 Corinthians 15, 4, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day, according to the scripture. And now he is proclaiming it as the central heart of the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15 where the gospel is given to us in a nutshell in verses 3 and 4. Ephesians 2, 1, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. He understands not only the physical reality, but he understands the spiritual implications of being spiritually dead. You and I were not spiritually sick. We were spiritually dead. You hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Colossians 2.13, And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Blind and dead. Blind and dead. And as we understand scripture, so once were we all. It is the grace of God who reached down and gave us light and life through the gospel. Our gracious Heavenly Father, again we thank you for the privilege of being here tonight to study your word. It is your word, not our word. It's not the word of man, it's the word of God. And when we truly believe, it changes our lives. When we have genuine faith and true theology, it means that suddenly... All of our past was shattered, and suddenly now we have new goals, new insights, new obedience. The things that we used to do, we don't do anymore. The things that we didn't do that we should have done, now you empower us and motivate us to do. Father, we pray that you will take your word as it has gone forth tonight. And as we prayed before, that it will not return to you void, but that it will prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. Your word is supernatural. Your word changes lives. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.